Well, hey everyone, welcome back. I'm so glad that you're with us today, the last Sunday of August, which means tomorrow is the first day of school, at least for most of our kids. And I just want to say, if, if you're a student going back to school, or you're a teacher, an administrator working in a school, we're praying for you. Schooling obviously matters a lot. We pray God's blessing on you. Kids, we just pray that you're going to be like Jesus, growing in wisdom and in stature and favor with God and man, and that you'll be doing it safely and in an environment where you thrive. Whether you're public schooler, private schooler, homeschooler, we are for you. Our hearts are for you. We're praying for you. But that's tomorrow. Today, Sunday, is the last day of our summer preaching series on the Ten Commandments. The law in our hearts, the ten words, the Decalogue for today. And we really do live in a different day today because originally the Ten Commandments were written on tablets of stone to people who were still largely lost in their own sin. They had their own rebellious hearts within them that could not obey that law. Things have changed now in this new covenant era. Jesus has forgiven all of our sins because of his death on the cross. He's reconciled us to God And he is recreating us from the inside out, giving us a new heart, written his law on our hearts, which is really just a summary of his will and his ways. And then he's put his Holy Spirit within us as well to empower us, to move us, to walk in God's ways, to obey God. We don't obey perfectly. We stumble and fall all the time, but we are no longer resisting or resenting God. Now, we love God. We want to walk in His ways. And so we're grateful for these 10 words that summarize His moral code. It's what the people in the Old Testament really needed because they were coming out of the land of Egypt, out of slavery, where someone else's will and ways had sway over their lives. Now they're going into the promised land. They're going into a land of abundance, into a land of freedom, into a land flowing with milk and honey, into a land where they are going to dwell with God. It's God and His law that's going to determine their lives, and that's why God has to deliver it to them, so that they'll know how to thrive in the promised land. You might look at the Ten Commandments, we said, just as proscribing the circle of God's blessing. Inside this circle, you're going to know God and enjoy Him forever. And it might look narrow and confining, but please don't see it that way. It's more like, hey, you know, just like the promised land has physical borders, an abundant life with God has moral and spiritual borders. And they are not so confining as you might think. We said, you know, look at it like Mufasa and Simba surveying the Pride Lands. Everywhere where the light touches, this fertile, flourishing land teeming with life, this is our world. We get to reign in it together. That shadowy place, the graveyard over there, the place of death, that's beyond our borders. Or you might think of it as the children going into Narnia. The wardrobe seems cramped, but it's just a portal into a magical land where Aslan lives and where these children are destined to reign with him and enjoy him forever. That's what's going on with the Ten Commandments. We're coming to the end today. Tenth Commandment is on the plate, but I just want to read the whole list to us one more time. This is Exodus 20, 1 through 17, slightly condensed. And God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless, who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. 
Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. And here, number 10, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male or female servant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God for it. Now, this final command against coveting might strike us initially as a bit underwhelming. It's like, where's the fireworks? Where's the big crescendo at the end? I mean, the Ten Commandments starts with a bang. God says, I brought you out of the land of Egypt. You shall have no other gods before me. Then by the time you get to number 10, it's like, and hey, stop looking at your neighbor's donkey. You're like, where is that coming from? How is that a fitting conclusion to the Decalogue? Well, think with me here because I think it's perfect. All the previous nine commandments are largely behavioral. Now, there's a heart behind those behaviors, but they're largely behavioral. You make an idol. You take God's name in vain. You kill or you steal. You know, you, you, you violate the Sabbath. You can see when people are doing these things. They're actions. The Tenth Commandment's not an action. It's an affection. It's a question of your heart. What do you want? What do you desire? And in that way, it is a fitting conclusion to the entire Decalogue. Remember, the Ten Commandments we think of as in two tables, the two tables of the law. The first table regulates our relationship with God. The second one guides our relationships with others. Two great commandments in the Bible. Love God with all your heart. Love your neighbor as yourself. The affections of our hearts tell us whether or not we're obeying both. I think about your desires with regard to God. 1 John 2, 15 says this, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now, this doesn't mean we can't enjoy the things of this world, that we can't receive them with gratitude, but it's a subtle thing to enjoy the world without loving it inordinately. Romans 1 talks about people who exchange the glory of God for created things. We do it all the time. And the command against coveting will just help us to identify if our first love is really our first love. And actually, if it's our one and only love. Likewise, the second table of law, dealing with others. I mean, it's important to say, don't kill don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't lie. But it's really about what is our heart posture toward others and has our desire for things gotten in the way and mucked everything up. Look at what James 4, 1 and 2 says. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Isn't it your desires that battle within you? You desire but do not have, so you kill. At least some people do. You covet but cannot get what you want. So you quarrel and fight. We all do that. And so do not covet is the perfect conclusion to the law. It forces us to look at our hearts and name what our affections are so that we can enjoy the abundant life that God has for us. Proverbs 4.23, above all else, guard your heart or guard your heart with all vigilance. For from it flows the springs of life. The 10th commandment helps us to guard our hearts. It's a safeguard on those things. So how do we not only avoid coveting, desiring, lusting for, having this acquisitive spirit? Uh, how do we avoid doing that? And then like develop our hearts and our affections in the way that they should go. Well, let's talk about that as we go here. I've got three C's for you to counter coveting. Here's how we counter coveting. First, clarify your needs and desires. Clarify your needs and desires. First, it's get clear on what do you need and what do you want. I don't know about you, but I have kids who tell me all the time that they need things. 
Sometimes they need things so desperately, like, if I don't get this, I'm going to die. It sounds pretty serious. And the thing that they need, you know, otherwise they face death, things like um, earrings, shoes, hair extensions, slime that they've seen on YouTube. I got to have this or I'm going to die. Now, children do that, right? I think big people do too. We're too mature to vocalize it. But don't we pin our affections on things and say we need them when we really want them? I came across a great graphic this week. I'll tell you where it comes from in a moment. But it distinguishes Maslow's hierarchy of need with a better understanding of reality. You, many of us know, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of need goes from physical and security needs at bottom. We all have these things all the way up to self-actualization or self-realization. And, and the point the writer here is making or the cartoonist is we say all of those things are needs. But in reality, we all have some basic physical and security needs. Beyond that, it's pretty much all wants. And it's not just a want for things, but if you can make it out on that graphic, there's a little star there that says prestige. There's a little sword there that says glory. It's not just tangible things, but intangible that we want. We don't necessarily need them, but we want them. Let's get clear on this. What do you want? We all have basic needs. What do you want? What are your hopes and affections pinned on? You not only need to clarify honestly what those things are, but we need to think about where those things are taking us. Not just if we get them, where will they take us, but the very pursuit of them. Where is that vectoring our lives? Timothy uh, was told this by the Apostle Paul. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. That is a very sobering word, especially for me as a pastor, because I could name names of people that have fallen prey to this very thing. They have pursued money and the things that money can buy, and it has ruined their lives and their relationships. It has drawn them away from the faith. In one case, that notable case I can think of, uh, a person I know and used to vacation with has renounced his faith in Christ. He's a very, very rich man. But as Jesus said, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? It can happen. The things that we want and desire can be really functionally our gods. In fact, we could be trying to use the one true God just as a means of getting the thing that's our real God. Like, if I please God, if I check the boxes, if I keep my nose clean, I think he'll bless me with the thing that I really want that my affections are really set upon. God save us from that. So here's just a really simple question I would like to, us all to consider. Fill in this blank. If only I had blank, I'd be happy. If only I had blank, I'd be happy. Chances are a lot of us could put a temporal thing a thing of this world in that blank? Let's be honest with ourselves on that. And then, having named it, we can assert power over it, first and most notably, by confessing it as sin to God. And just say, God, please forgive my inordinate desire for blank. Let's clarify our needs and our wants and then let's begin to attune our affections where they should go. Secondly, here's the second C to counter covetousness. Cultivate a desire for your greatest need. Cultivate a desire for your greatest need. 
Now, your greatest need, as well as your greatest desire, I trust you know, is God. God is the thing the whole world needs most. I say thing. I do not mean that irreverently. God is the person the whole world desperately needs. And he's the one person on whom you can pin your desires for ultimate fulfillment. But, but we might not know that yet. We might not want God like we wish we would, but maybe we know we need him. Well, cultivate that desire for him. He loves it even if we bring our feeble desires and say, God, grow these. Develop this in me. I want to have a true heart and yearning for you. Desire, by the way, is not bad. You know, in Buddhism, desire is bad. The whole point of a Buddhist philosophy of life is to try to eliminate desire so that you also eliminate the trouble and the stress and the depression that comes from unfulfilled desires. That is not Christianity. Christianity loves desire. It knows that God's put eternity in our hearts. He has made us to yearn for and crave transcendent things, namely himself. And so we want to have a growing heart and hunger for God. This is where we quote C.S. Lewis, who famously said, It would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. Far too easily pleased by created things when the glories of a creator and knowing him deeply and intimately are on offer to us. Psalm 1611, maybe the all time most quoted verse at Willowdale Chapel. God, you have shown me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forever. God is where the good life is at because he is goodness personified. Psalm 37, 4 says, Delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. That is, pin your affections on God, your wants, your hungers on Him, and He will give you Himself. And you will be satisfied beyond anything that you could ever imagine. But we have to cultivate this desire. It does not come naturally to us, even as redeemed new covenant people. We need to cultivate this desire. How do we do it? Well, let me just share two simple helps. One that means a lot to me. One that is going to mean more to me in this year ahead, and I hope it will you too. The one that already means a ton to me is the scriptures, God's word, memorizing scripture, Meditating on scripture tunes my heart to God like nothing else does. Hey, I love the outdoors. I love walks in nature. I take three or four of those a week, at least with my dog. It's one of my great weekly pleasures. But nothing compares to the kind of intimacy and awareness that I can cultivate with God through meditating on scriptures I've memorized. I mean, just the other night, I was laying in bed. I, I just couldn't fall asleep. And so I just went back to Colossians 3, 1 through 4, some great verses that I just love. And I just began to meditatively repeat them. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, appears for the second time, you also will appear with him in glory. Hey, 
I've got a lot of wonderful things to enjoy in this world. Most importantly, the people that God has blessed me with, my wife and my children, extended family and friends. But even those will one day pale by comparison to the glory that I'm going to share face to face with Christ. And when I just meditate on Colossians 3 that way, it, it just tunes up my heart. It just sets my affections like I'm ready for that. I'm ready when you are, God. I mean, I, I hope I go on living for 30 more years here, but uh, I'm ready. I want to always be ready to meet you because that's going to be the best of all. Or Psalm 103, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals eventually all your diseases who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. God satisfies the soul with so many good things. And just meditating on that keeps my affections pinned on Him. But now, here's the second help. It means a lot to me, but I'm going to make sure it means more to me going forward. I hope it will for you too. And that is community. Community. Little sidebar here. One of our great priorities for this coming ministry year is that we want to put group life, small group life back on the front burner. In certain quarters of our church's life and ministry, it's just been back burnered for a while. We want to put it on the front burner. Because we need each other. We need relationships. And they need to be, I mean, they can be fun and spontaneous and serendipitous, but they also need to have some intentionality. Like we're pursuing Jesus together. We're on this journey of life together. We need this. It's not optional. I need more of this. Maybe you do too. And community is vitally important in helping us with our wants, with our desires. There's a great book I just read by Luke Burgess, who's an entrepreneur and a college prof called Wanting. The subtitle is The Power of Mimetic Desire in Everyday Life. You're like, what in the world does mimetic mean? It just means mimicked, imitated, often unconsciously. Luke Burgess plays out all the ways in which our wants and desires are shaped by other people. We don't just begin to desire because something is innate in us and and, and we hunger for food that way and air, but almost all of our other desires are shaped by what the people around us are wanting. He gives all kinds of like, not only, you know, sociological and psychological research data, but just great illustrations of this. I mean, have you ever gone out to eat? And you're looking at the menu and nothing particularly strikes you. And so you say, what are you thinking about having? You know, and your partner, your friend's like, well, I'm looking at this. Suddenly you're like, that sounds really good. I'm now beginning to want that more just because you wanted it. Maybe you go thrifting with your friend. You're in a consignment shop. You're looking around. There's lots of clothes. You'd sort of like to have a new shirt, but you don't see anything. Then your friend pulls one out and says, ooh, I really like this. Now you're like, dang, I like it too, and there's only one, and you've got it first. Um, We can get competitive with our desires that way. Luke Burgess, being a college prof, says, you know, this happens all the time in college. You know, students come in here from a million different backgrounds. They all have different dreams and aspirations. They have some vision for what their life could be vocationally. And then by the time they're ready to graduate, every single one of them is either pursuing medicine or law or engineering or finance. He has a graphic for this one too. That's where I got the first graphic. Look at this. It's like, this is the mimetic machine. We all come in unique. We all come out fitting into the same box. Uh, There's one quote that I found not only funny, but devastating. Um, in, In his book, he says, he's quoting someone else, a woman named Dana. We want what other people want because other people want it. And it's penciled in eyebrows all the way down, down to the depths of the ninth circle of hell, where we all die of a Brazilian butt lift over and over again. (laughs) 
that's what's going on with our desires. And we can all, just by seeing the world around us and the things that influencers and experts or just popular people are pursuing, and we start to pursue those things too. Why does everybody need a $40 Stanley mug? I don't know, because somebody said those were like the best thing going. Our desires are so mimicked and shaped by the community. But just as we can therefore set our affections on all sorts of trivial things, Luke Burgess points out that in a solid community, in a spiritual community, we can help each other by developing what he calls thick desires, transcendent desires, things that are worthy of our lives and our pursuits, like our knowledge of God, like the intimacy of our relationships, like the thriving of our children. We need a community to keep our desires straight. And it's not just that they help us, we help them. Listen to this, Luke Burgess says this, transforming desire happens through relationships. Through our relationships, we help other people with their wants in one of three ways. We help them want more or less or differently. Like a giant flywheel, we are gently nudging other people's desires in one direction or another. And therefore, he says, live as if you have a responsibility for what other people want. And you do, and so do I. Just as these others have responsibility for my wants and desires. So let's be in a thick community of thick transcendent desire. Just to all keep ourselves within the circle of God's blessing. You know, Luke Burgess there reminds me of something C.S. Lewis said. You know, every day we're helping each other to one of two destinations. And it's not just a destination as a place like heaven or hell. It's the destination of our own identities. Who are we becoming? He says every day we're helping each other either become immortal horrors or everlasting splendors. For me, scripture shapes my affections like no other and community well, it malforms me at times. I want to make sure it is forming me up to have a heart for God more and more in this year ahead. Well, those are two C's to counter covetousness. Here's the third one. Contentment, contentment, contentment. You know, you got the three rules of real estate, location, location, location. This governs the real estate of our hearts. Contentment, contentment, contentment. You know what's better than desiring what you don't have? Appreciating and enjoying what you do have. And God has given us so much. 1 Timothy 6, 17, it's got a warning, but it also has a wonderful truth. It says, as for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. James 1 says that every good gift comes down from the Father of lights. And do we not enjoy them every day? Now, they're given, I should add, not just for our enjoyment, certainly not just for our self-indulgence. God gives in order that we might bless those who have need. God gives in order that we might share in ministry the responsibilities of maintaining a thriving gospel ministry and a church. That's a part of why God gives as well. But he also wants us to enjoy it. He doesn't resent our enjoyment. He, he created them pleasurable so that we would find pleasure in them. So better than wanting what you don't have is enjoying gratefully what you do have. Slow down. Count your blessings. Keep a journal where every day you write down three things you are thankful for. Try to make them different every day. It's actually a proven strategy for keeping your heart happy and satisfied. And also just remember that our list of needs is actually very small. And a godly person is happy just with those. Paul said to Timothy, but godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, 
we will be content with that. We will, right? I hope we will. That's pretty simple. If we have food and clothing, we'll be content with that. I don't know about you. I've got plenty of food. And I got more clothing that I could wear in a month. I can be content with that. And then just elated at everything else. By the way, have you ever like lost something? You knew it mattered. But once it was lost, it really mattered. I mean, just recently, we were getting ready to go away on our vacation. And I think it was just a day or two before I had to come and sheepishly say to my wife, uh, I think I lost my credit card. Now, that was bad. What was even worse is we just had a fraud alert a couple weeks before and had just gone through like getting new cards and plugging in the new numbers and all the things where we have, you know, that information saved. And, and now I'm coming back saying, I think I lost my credit card. And the slot in my wallet where it normally is, it was not there. I said, I have no idea what I did with it. I've been all through my car. I can't find it. And then a moment or two later, Deanne goes out and she finds it in her car. I have no idea how. She said, I found it down like between the seat and the center console there. I found it there. And I can't tell you like how elated I was. It's like my day just got really great. Because I was feeling bad about losing a credit card. Not only are we have to replace it, we have to go like try to get like a big stack of cash because we're leaving on a road trip. We got to pay for food and gas and all that kind of stuff. I mean, we can't just tap the card now. I was so happy just to have a credit card that was found in my second car. That's ridiculous. I own two cars. Can you believe that? I got two cars. Do you ever look at your life like that? All these things that we take for granted are ridiculous luxuries. How can we not enjoy them and be really open-handed and generous with others who might lack some of those things? Let's cultivate contentment, contentment, contentment. Because God's a good God. He gives us everything we need if we can perceive it. I want to just close with a, a poem. I mean, I'm not like a three points in a poem. I'm a three point preacher, but not three points in a poem. But I got a little poem for you today. I don't know who wrote it. I just came across it in my studies this week. It's a good one. It says, it was spring, but it was summer I wanted. The warm days and great outdoors. It was summer, but it was fall I wanted. The colorful leaves and cool, dry air. It was fall, but it was winter I wanted the beautiful snow and joy of the holidays. It was winter, but it was spring I wanted, the warmth and blossoming of nature. I was a child, but it was adulthood I wanted, the freedom and the respect. I was 20, but it was 30 I wanted to be mature and sophisticated. I was middle-aged, but it was 20 I wanted, the youth and the free spirit. I was retired, but it was middle-aged I wanted, the presence of mind without limitations. My life was over and I never got what I wanted. It's a great lesson in contentment and presence and awareness because of course this person got everything they wanted. Just maybe not at the moment when their wanter was attuned to it. Let's be content with what we have. Let's love God first and best and only in our lives and receive every gift as what it actually is. A gift, gratuitous, a thing of sheer grace. And let's recall, as Romans 8.32 says, if God did not spare his only son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not with him Also, graciously give us all things. All things are coming to us. We're all trust fund babies about to own the universe. We got no worries. We're going to trust in the Lord. We're going to seek first his kingdom. He'll provide all we need. And then it's glory after that. Let's not covet. We are a people who don't covet. Let's help each other with that. And God be with you this week ahead. Thanks for checking out our online teaching. 
you enjoyed this content and would like some more information about us, head over to our website at www.willowdalechapel.org or download our app. There you can stay up to date on any events, ministries, and other opportunities we have coming up at Willowdale Chapel.